The Truth About Goblins Chapter 24 Once again, the three found themselves in the quieter part of town, where the streets were overrun by trees and children rather than shops and vendors. Under and over branches they went, following Kit's lead as they crept further away from the festivities on Main Street. The area was nearly void of any noise whatsoever on this particular night. Most of the children who lived there had been drawn away by the celebrations on the other side of town. Kit, Annie, and Sapphira were on their own. It was only when they stopped in front of an old stone tower that they heard someone else. Who goes there? came a voice, drifting down from the tower's top window. The stonework was crumbling, the roof nothing more than a patchwork of old shingles. If not for the trees supporting the structure on either side, it would have collapsed long ago. We're here to see the Black Raven, said Kit. Two hooded figures emerged from the bushes, circling the trio. Annie and Sapphira jumped back in surprise. The attackers were short, but each brandished a menacing knife in their hands. And who are you? said the voice. A friend, said Kit, refusing to be intimidated. I must speak with her. The voice spoke a command and the two hoodlings withdrew. There was a clicking noise from inside the tower before the voice came again. You may enter. Kit pushed on the door and gestured for the other two to follow. The darkness of the tower wasn't inviting, but neither of them dared to speak as they entered. The hooded sentinels from before flanked the group, guiding them to another room up the stairs and down the hallway. There were other hooded children along the way, eyeing the strangers curiously and whispering amongst themselves. The place was strangely similar to the Arbiter's Tower, except it was much darker and all the more secretive. Not to mention that Annie didn't spot any adults hanging around. Oh, wait here, said one of the guards. He entered the door ahead and left the three behind. They could hear the soft mutterings of a discussion taking place on the other side. Minutes passed. The three stood waiting, still in costume. Annie would have scolded Kit for bringing them to such a shady place, but she was too nervous to speak. At last, the door opened. Two hooded guards stepped out, standing to attention as they were followed by two more. Another pair emerged, this time wearing red, and slightly taller than the first four. And then, striding through the aisle created by the six sentinels, the black raven appeared. She was a shadow of robes and feathers. She because there was something of feminine grace in the way she swayed from foot to foot. Towering over the others in the room, the black raven moved with the charm inspired by confidence, her voice on the edge of enchantment. Who are you? said the black raven, her words slow and deliberate. And what do you want? We have a favor to ask of you, replied Kit. That tells me nothing. The black raven cocked her head to the side, her expression concealed behind a black mask. A long beak, more of those feathers, and two dark holes for eyes. Are you friend or foe? I hope I am still considered a friend of yours, raven. He removed his own mask, pulling out a dark blue feather from his pocket. And hold me in higher esteem than your accomplice in the tower. Eyeing the feather in his hand, the black raven went silent. Kit chuckled. You're quick, raven, but the fox is quicker yet. Another pause, followed by a sigh. And then, with a flick of her wrist and a whisper, she ordered her guards to disband. They all filed back into the room behind her. Come then, little fox, she said, motioning for them to follow, and let us meet as friends. She exited the room with the other three just behind. As they walked through, one of the hoodlings shut the door behind them. 
Upon entering the next space, the three were surprised to find it quite lavish, for that part of town, anyway. The chairs were patched, but they were soft. The carpet was stained, but it was plush. And although it was dark, there were candles scattered around to give some warmth to the place, making the room surprisingly comfortable. The black raven sent her guards to the edges of the room and beckoned for her red servants to approach. As she lifted her arms, they removed the disguise. First went the hood, revealing a head of thick, nappy hair, and then the sleeves, along with the rest of the cloak that surrounded her. Left exposed, Annie and Sephira were surprised to see that the black raven was a child, walking on short stilts that gave her the advantage of a few extra inches. Now that the cloak was removed, her servants held her waist and allowed her to kick off the stilts from her boots. On her own two feet at last, she strode up to Kit and eyed him through the mask. You seem well acquainted with my recent dealings, she said, looking up at him. How do you know of the magician in the tower? Kit smiled with all the respect he could muster. You know my ways, the ways of the fox. I gained entrance to the tower shortly after your escape. Her shoulders shook as she chuckled. Ah, Kitsune, if you had no parents, I should make you one of my order for all your qualities. Finally, she removed the mask. Her eyes gleamed with a violet light, shining like tiny, distant galaxies against her dark skin. Even in the dim light, they almost seemed to glow, but their celestial beauty did little to hide the grief behind her gaze. It is because of your order that I have come, said Kit. I need your help. Raven raised an eyebrow. With all the resources at your disposal, little fox, I should doubt you require much aid, even from us. It's not for me, he said. I owe a friend a favor, a favor I can't pay. Trouble? Her eyes twinkled with mischief. I do not wish to make enemies. No, it's not what you think. Looking first at Sephira and then back to Raven, he added, We're looking for someone. Truly, she eyed him suspiciously. Strange. You are not the only one with such a request. You may not find us to be of much help, I'm afraid, for we were unable to carry out our previous task. She sighed, her grief tugging at the edge of her lips. What is the name, if I may ask? Donovan, he replied. He is not from this market, else I would know of him. She seemed relieved by the name. Nor do I. But aside from one instance, my murder has always managed to uncover the truth, no matter how fervently others attempt to hide it. That is why I have come to you, and no one else, he said. I have faith that your murder of crows will yield the results we seek. He paused. At a price, of course. Of course. She looked from Annie to Sephira before turning her gaze back to Kit. But we are... She paused. I am in need of a great favor. In ordinary circumstances, payment would be a simple matter. He frowned. Is something wrong? She looked back to the two girls, weighing her thoughts. Come with me, she said finally. But your friends stay here. He cast an apologetic look towards Annie. All right, they'll stay. And then, turning back to Raven, Let's go. Leaving her guards behind, she led the way past a thick curtain and into a secret alcove. This passage led to yet another door, guarded by one of the red sentinels. Be at ease, she said, noting the guard's wary glances. He's with me. The two entered the room. It was very dark. There was no light save for a fire burning in the corner. 
There were two children seated opposite to it, a boy and a girl, exchanging nervous whispers. They stood to attention as Raven entered. How is he? she asked. The two shook their heads and said nothing, eyes downcast. The scene confused Kit until he heard a cough from the other end of the room. Following the sound, his eyes fell on a small figure, bundled up in layers of blankets but still shivering. At the sound of Raven's voice, the child in bed turned his head, revealing two very large and sickly eyes. Jay! Kit ran towards the bed. Careful, said Raven. It may be contagious. It's not, he said, kneeling beside the bed. Else there would be others in your murder with the illness. He pulled a blanket from the young boy's face. Jay? Jay, you all right? How you feeling, Captain? Jay mumbled and shut his eyes again. His face was deathly pale, and there was sweat dripping down his forehead in torrents. Kit picked up a towel lying in a bowl of water by his feet. What is he suffering from? He said, patting Jay's head with the towel. Do you know? The one from the tower tells me it's poison, said Raven, but I cannot be sure. He held Jay's head in his hands, gently turning his face. It is poison. See? Look here. He pointed to where the boy's hair had grown white. But how could it be poison? She said, taking her place beside him. We've tried every remedy for poison, and his condition has only worsened. What remedies? he asked. The usual list, she said. Ruby juice, silver nettle, blood runner, anything we could find. But no good. He looked at the poor kid lying in bed, barely conscious. He was on his feet just days ago, for the sickness to have progressed this quickly. Still by the bed, Kit let his words trail off into silence. He didn't say a word, he only turned his head towards Raven and stared at her. His expression was blank, but she knew what he was thinking. She stood, looking to the two children behind her. Get out! They slipped out of the room as quickly as they could, leaving Kit and Raven with Jay still in bed. Now alone, they stayed silent a long while, refusing to speak. And then Kit got to his feet. He's not your brother, is he? Raven looked away. He's human, isn't he? Kitsune, do you realize how dangerous this is? He clenched his fists to keep from shouting. You know humans can't eat stuff from down here. We were careful. She was also struggling to keep her voice low. We made a mistake. It was an accident. And how old was he? Said Kit, the heat rising to his face. Did he have parents above ground? When did you bring him here? She shook her head. None of that is important. Important. It looked as though he was about to scream in frustration. You brought a human child to the goblin market. I had to. Finally, she turned to meet his gaze. He was alone, Kitsune, just like all the rest. I didn't take him away from anything, from anyone. It makes no difference to me if he is human. He is my brother, and he is dying. Please. There was a moan from the bed. They both went silent, turning back to Jay. All the anger in the room vanished. The heat of the argument was gone. Dazed. Raven dragged her feet across the floor and sat down on the bed next to her brother, taking his hand in hers. Please, she said, her voice barely a whisper. He's dying, Kitsune. He's dying and I can't save him. She covered her face with her hands. Please. Still standing, Kit turned his gaze towards the fire. I won't let him die, Raven. 
She looked up at him. But one day you're gonna... I mean, ugh. He sighed. You're going to have to tell him everything. I will. I surely will. She clasped her hands together, almost pleadingly. Just save him. Save him, Kitsune, and I will do anything for you. Anything in my power, I swear it. That's not necessary, he said, approaching the bed. I care about him too, it's just... Once again, he went silent. What is it? She lowered her voice. There is something else? He shook his head and headed for the door. You don't normally take humans down here, do you? Human children. Only him, and only because I had no other choice. She frowned. Why? He stopped in front of the door. Just don't do it again, okay? It's not right. He turned back to her. Their eyes met once more. Maybe I wouldn't have cared before, but I have a friend. She nodded, as if she understood completely. It isn't right. Right. He looked back to the ground. You said something about Grim? The magician in the tower. Her voice took on a hostile tone. He is not my accomplice. He said he has an antidote, but I could not buy it from him nor was I successful in stealing it. Their encounter at the tower was beginning to make sense. I'll get it, he said, his hand on the door. Be wary of him. She caught his gaze and pulled up her sleeve. He is more dangerous than he appears. He hesitated at the sight of her arm. Scars or burns, but not from a blade or from heat. It was warning enough. I'll get it, he repeated, slipping into the hall. He took a deep breath as he closed the door behind him. He had come to find Donovan for Timothy. Instead, he found Jay dying. He forced himself into action and went back the way he came, still anxious as he met up with Annie and Sephira. Without looking at either of the two, he gestured for them to follow. Let's go, he said. But what happened? said Annie, rising from her seat. Will they do it? Who cares, he muttered, brushing past them on his way down the stairs. What was that? said Sephira. What do they want in exchange? An antidote. He kept his eyes on his feet. We have to hurry. Why? said Annie. Is something wrong? He said nothing more as they left the small tower and slipped back into the streets. Only when they were at a safe distance from the Black Raven's headquarters did he speak again. Raven's brother is dying, he said. He's been poisoned. Oh, that's awful, said Sephira. How did it happen? It was by accident, he said. For the longest time, everyone thought Jay was a goblin, but it turns out he's human. So he's suffering from goblin sickness, she said. He must have eaten something unsafe for humans. Exactly, he said. Which makes our job more difficult, since goblin sickness is considered incurable if you don't know the source, and there's no medicine above ground that can help. Then where are we going? said Annie. If there's no cure, why did you mention something about an antidote? Because I'm not going to let my friend die, that's why. He clenched his fists again. I think it's high time I pay Mr. Grimm another visit. Wait, said Annie. You mean that guy from the tower? Are you sure that's a good idea? From what you told me, he sounds shifty. I've heard unpleasant things about him as well, said Sephira. Yeah, well, I'm out of options here. His hasty strides betrayed his frustration. I don't care where the antidote comes from as long as it works. What if he doesn't have it? said Annie. Or doesn't want to give it to you? I won't take no for an answer, 
he said. That creep's not about to scare me away. The trio came to a halt as the tower came into view. There it stood, a shadow over the near-empty streets. The silence set them on edge. That's the tower? said Annie. Not exactly what I imagined. Kit stared a long while before looking down at his feet. I don't have a choice. But as he walked towards the door, Annie pulled him back. Just a minute, hothead, this might not be a good idea. Well, I hate to break it to you, but I'm out of good ideas. No, not that, she said. I was thinking about your last visit. Maybe it's better if Safira and I go in without you. He turned back to the two of them. Do you really think so? Why? said Safira. What happened between you and that magician? Nothing serious, he frowned. But maybe Annie's right. He might give me a hard time just to get back at me for snooping. He glanced towards the door. Are you sure you two will be all right? We're big kids, joked Annie. We can handle it. And after that night in the mines, I'm not afraid of one creepy magician. Neither am I, said Safira. I know what we need, and I know we can get it. Just wait here, and we'll be back before you know it. One last time, he asked, Are you sure? They both nodded. He shrugged and reluctantly backed away. Without another word, the girls left him waiting and headed for the tower. Hey, hi, I'm your narrator, Miranda Eastwood, also the author of The Truth About Goblins. If you liked this chapter, remember to add, follow, or subscribe to this channel so you can hear the next one. And if you didn't like this chapter, <laughs> oh well, I can't really do anything about that. In any case, I just thought I'd let you know about my Patreon. You can check it out if you'd like to throw some support my way. It would mean a lot to me. Not to mention there's loads of extra exclusive content that I only post on Patreon. While I'm at it, I'll mention that The Truth About Goblins is now available as a complete audiobook, and you can get it wherever you get your audiobooks. Thanks for listening!